while we continue to the Gospel of Mark. So if you please would turn to Mark chapter 7. We'll be reading verses 14 to 20, 23. 14 to 23. Mark chapter 7. This is the word of the living God. Verse 14. And he, that is Christ, called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, Covening, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for your word. Lord, there's times when your word is, in a sense, naturally sweet, Lord, where, in a sense, it's naturally honeycomb. Lord, where we read of your great mercy and your great love for sinners, Lord. And there's other times, Father, when the word is still sweet, Lord, but it comes in a way, Lord, that can kind of sting us at first, Lord. Because of the remaining corruption that we have, knowing who our inner man still is, Lord. Help us this hour, Lord. We believe in the power of the Spirit, Lord. We believe that your Spirit is able, Lord, to take your word and apply it to the hearts of your people through feeble preaching. Lord, we believe in that. Help us to believe more. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, you know, everyone's going to, in a sense, try to get their resolutions going, right? The whole New Year, New Me aspects of the New Year's resolution. And, you know, resolutions aren't sinful or they're not that bad. They're, they could be good things if they're done right. But more often than not, New Year's resolutions end up over within the first couple weeks. They don't continue on through the rest of the year. So my advice is to actually, instead of looking at just this month of January, try to even look at 2019. Some of the ambitions you had for 2019, some of the goals you had for 2019, or how about this, the sanctification you had in 2019. I remember being a young Christian and hearing my pastor, my former pastor say, Anytime you get to a new year, ask yourself, am I more holy this year than I was at the beginning of last year? Am I loving Christ more this year than I did last year? Has my overall fight against sin and my desire for His Word grown over this last year, or has that stayed the same? A year in review. Are you holier than last year? Helpful questions to look at. Even us. Some of you might not know this, But today is the day that our church turns one year old, as it were. I remember leading up to this, even last year, being nervous and wondering what it was going to look like and not even knowing some people that are in this room. And man, the way that the year had gone, the Lord just completely preserved us and was gracious to us and helped us. What was it? What what is it that helps us progress in the Christian life? Hopefully we'll be able to answer that this morning, even as a perfect sermon to start the new year. But before we get there, Luis had covered hypocrisy. I actually was going to spend a whole uh, Sunday sermon on hypocrisy, but Luis covered most of that without even knowing that that was what was going to be my topic this week. But I do want to address just one element of hypocrisy that was highlighted in the text last week or two weeks ago that I did not get to. And it's where Isaiah speaks of in verse six and seven. It says this, and Christ said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 7, in vain, in vain do they worship me, 
teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So here, this is kind of a, a helpful theme. Lip service or true heart compassion. Lip service or a true heart in worship. See, Christ here is quoting Isaiah. If you go to Isaiah, this is not a direct prophecy about Pharisees in the year, you know, two or whatever we want to call this year, right? So is this Christ misapplying the word of God? Saying that, 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 that Isaiah is talking about you? When you go to Isaiah, he's not really talking about them? No, what's going on here is Christ is using the word of God as it was designed to be used. You look at a text. You see its immediate context, but then you can also see this is being applied to even us today. For instance, Jeremiah 79 was spoken to the Israelites, but is it not true for us that our hearts are wicked? Who can know it? Our hearts are desperately wicked. So we see the power of the Word of God where regardless of the timeless aspects of the Word of God, where regardless of where you could find a verse, there's an immediate context, yes, but it also be, can be applied to our hearts. And that's what Christ is doing here. What's he saying? The highest test of hypocrisy. Listen close. The highest test of hypocrisy is what we do in corporate worship. That's what he's saying here. In vain do they worship me. In vain are they offering up sacrifices to me. Why? Because in corporate worship, you can't fake it. You could walk around the streets looking nice and pretty on the outside. You could tell people you pray so many times a day in your home. You could tell people that you are reading your Bible Monday through Friday or whatever. But when we get here together, you can't fake worship. You can't fake longing for God, hungering for God, pleading for His help and His grace, needing Him. The hypocrite in worship, sure, they might close their eyes. They might repeat the words that are being sung on the screen, but there's no heartfelt emotion. I know we fall short. I'm not expecting anyone to have a perfect worshiping heart, but what I'm saying is singing is good. The hypocrite sings, but the Christian meditates on what he is singing. Praying is good, but the hypocrite prays, so the Christian pleads before the Lord. The hypocrite hears the call to worship and they remain unfazed by it. But the Christian hears the call to worship and begins to prep his heart to receive the word. The hypocrite hears preaching, but he's in and out of the sermon while the Christian in the heart of worship is engaging the words that are being said from the pulpit. Lip service as opposed to heart service. For instance, this morning when we were singing these powerful lyrics, Right? Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Son of God was he. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven lifted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Or full atonement can it be. Full atonement. Where your heart's not moved. As we're seeing that our worth is not in what we own, but it's in Christ. Was your heart not engaged and thankful saying, thank you, Lord, because I don't own much. I don't have much. I'm not that skilled. But thankfully, my worth is not in those things. It's in Christ. So I'm asking you this morning, as we sing every week, as we come into the corporate worship together, examine your hearts. Am I being hypocritical in the corporate worship of our church? Or am I truly engaging my heart, not just my lips? But moving on to this morning's text, we begin at verse 14. And here in verse 14, we see Christ taking the application of what he's been saying for the first 13 verses of this, of this chapter. Now he's applying it to the hearts of his people. He believes in real life experiences when he preaches. And verse 15, there's a word there called defilement. I think it would be helpful to kind of just go over what defilement is, since that's not a word that's used too much in our culture. Defilement, as prescribed in the Word of God, was when things became unclean or were unclean to put in your body, right? For instance, a leper, someone who had leprosy was unclean. He was a defiled person. And if you touched a leper, you would become defiled. But the Pharisees went OCD, in a sense. They went crazy, 
extreme on their views of defilement, so much even touching dirt that was touched by Gentiles, they became defiled. That's not what we're talking about here, right? So Jesus is saying, there is a real defilement, but it's not what goes, what comes from out into in, it's what comes in from out. That is what true defilement is. Of course, Christ is not talking about things like drugs that where we take, right, in the body, then we become completely overwhelmed and we become someone that we're not. He's not talking about things like strong street drugs that are out there. We obviously see what those do to people. He's talking about food and unwashed hands. Because in this day, people did not think that they were sinful inside. People thought that it was only the externals that caused people to be sinful. People thought in this day that as long as I could stay away from the sinful things in this world, the bad influence, I'm okay. Now, there is something to be said. We protect our children against things that are sinful in the world. We protect our own hearts against things that are sinful. We try not to expose ourselves to things that are not good for us, not wise for us. But that's not what he's getting at here. What he's getting at here is that we carry the sin in us. We in our hearts are naturally sinful and evil people. Stop blaming those around you. Look within and find the sin that is in your heart. Verse 17 through 19, we see that the disciples are sadly confused. They think it's a parable, right? This teaching is so unique that they thought, is this a parable? Explain to us the parable, Christ. Explain to us what's going on here. In fact, Peter, even after this, is still confused. Because in Acts chapter, chapter 10, Peter's hungry, and God comes to him in a vision and says, Peter, rise up and eat, and there's pigs there. And Peter says, Lord, I have never, never eaten anything unclean. So even after this perfect explanation, Peter is still confused in Acts chapter 10. So Christian, be thankful you forget things all the time. Even Peter forgot things that he was commanded by his own Lord. But that's an aside. We, what, he, what we have here is a monumental, revolutionary teaching. All foods declared clean. Thankfully, we can enjoy bacon now, right? We can enjoy good food, right? And there's elements where we see food is still harmful. But in all reality, Christ is saying, no, it's not even food that defiles you. It's not unwashed hands that defile, defile you. It's what comes out of your mouth. What comes out of our hearts, that's what verse 20 is getting at. When he says, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. Out of the heart. And just in case anyone thinks that he's talking about the literal pumping heart inside. No, he's talking about the control center of man. Out of the heart flows all other things. Not the beating heart, but the central aspect of who someone is, the source of all evils. Where is it? It's in our hearts, brothers and sisters. It's in who we are by nature. The monks, as Luis was talking about in Sunday school, they got it wrong. They thought they could flee the world and go hide away in their little monastery and that they would flee from evil things. No, they, they failed to realize they carried the evil things within them into the monastery as they were taking their evil hearts there. The Amish who think electricity and technology is wrong, we'll escape all that, we'll live off the land, we'll devote our life to God and family. They're failing to realize every time a new individual comes into their family, a new evil heart has come into that world. The Quakers got it wrong. J.C. Ryle once said, they, these people who seclude themselves from society are failing to see that they carry society in their hearts. They carry the world in their hearts. They carry evil things in their hearts. So verses 21 to 23, Christ gives a list of, of aspects that come out of the heart of man. Now, this list is not exhaustive, but no one could say, oh, I'm good. I don't do any of those things on that list. Christ covers every single human. It's not exhaustive, but it is comprehensive. We all fall under that. And we would be silly this morning. Listen, we would be absolutely silly if we looked at this list and said, well, I don't do eight out of ten. I'm getting a good score on this whole performance thing. That's a B, 80%. We would be absolutely ridiculous because what I'm saying this morning, if we're honest with ourselves, 
Every single one of us wrestles with some aspect of every single list, sin that is listed here in a real way. So let me attempt to be like Christ and apply this to our hearts this morning. Let me attempt to truly show you how we still wrestle with these sins, even as regenerate Christians, by addressing the heart. If the heart is the control of who we are, if the heart is what controls us, if the, out of the heart comes all the evil thoughts that we have, then what is, what is needing to happen for us this morning? We need our hearts to have real reformation. We need our hearts to have real, a real change. So regardless of where you fall, unbeliever, you obviously need a new heart. Your current heart is sinful, it's evil, it's a heart of stone, and apart from a new heart, you have no hope. You are a slave to sin, the Bible says. So that's, that's for the unbeliever, but what about for the believers in the room? The reality from this text is that we, by nature, by nature, are far worse than we honestly can admit. We are far worse than we would ever even think ourselves to be. And we would love to blame society. We would love to blame others. We would love to blame our family, the government, our jobs, etc., etc., etc. We would love to push the blame outward. But the root of it is that sin lies so deeply embedded in who we are. And we have a true radical problem. We have a sinful heart, but we have a true radical solution in the man Jesus Christ. So in 2020, or honestly for all of life, if we have success in the Christian life, if we're going to have any growth in the Christian life, this is what is the remedy. Realize that our deep, deep corruption is, inner, is in our inner man. But we have a deep, deep power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because in reality, this list here shows us one thing. Okay, The evil heart is not satisfied with Christ. The evil heart is finding its joy and its pleasures in other things, in the created things, rather than in the creator. That's the definition of idolatry, worshiping created things rather than the creator. Our idolatrous evil hearts do not believe nor are satisfied in Jesus Christ. That's why we sin. That's why we give ourselves over to these silly little sins that we read in the text. And I honestly cannot think of a better sermon to start this year with than the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the face against sin, in our fight against sin. Listen, we have attacks from our hearts. We have attacks from the world, from society, from Satan, from our friends and loved ones at times. We are being attacked all the day long, as the Bible says, how dare we believe that we can survive with a weak understanding of how we fight against sin? How dare we think that we can truly move forward in the Christian life if we think we're going to do it on our own strength? We who are prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God that I love, as the hymn says. If we are going to have any success against sin in 2020 or in our life, this is how. Okay, modern day preaching is super successful when it comes to the, this topic. Why? Because modern day preaching says this, you're just about to break through. You're just about to have your big success. You're just about to do that thing that God has called you to do. 2020 is your, your year. Isa told me that some church said, are you ready for 2020? No, is 2020 ready for you? Right? That is so disgusting and silly. Why is modern day preaching so successful? Because it puts... You in the fight as if you have the power to fight against sin in and of yourself. And then what happens? A week later, they're preaching the same sermon. Two weeks later, the same sermon. Right? Haven't you ever wondered when modern day preachers make all these promises that your breakthrough is coming? I've never heard anyone say my breakthrough came. I've never heard anyone say, yeah, it happened. Just like you said, I finally was able to overcome. No, what happens is they keep on needing the same motivational message, the same motivational message. Why? Because we in ourselves do not possess the ability to fight sin. We would love to have credit in the fight against sin. 
we would love to say, you know what helped me? I started doing this, that, and the other thing. And that's why I got over that sin. No, remember what the hymn said. My power is in the power of God. My hope is in the hope that I have in God. So, in the gospel of, of grace, in our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is what we have to fight against the flesh and sin. This is what we have been given in the gospel. And Christian, this should make your heart truly beat and have joy in Jesus Christ. What we receive in the gospel, who we are in Christ, who we are in his resurrected life, what we have received in Christ. Listen, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are new creatures in Jesus Christ. The old has passed away, and behold, the new is for coming forth. And as new creatures, we, don't no, we no longer have evil, sinful hearts. There's a remaining corruption there. We still battle the evil heart, but we have been given a new heart with new affections and new desires and new wants and new hopes. As if that was not enough, we are even sealed with the Holy Spirit, a seal that no man can break, a seal that no temptation can break, a seal that no, no enemy can break. Once when we were fickle and moody and going from left to right, now we've been sealed and given the guarantee of heaven. And that spirit that has sealed us is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Raised Christ from the dead. Listen, the spirit that lives within you, dear Christian, is a spirit of power, not of fear. A spirit that gives you an ability to overcome. A spirit that now leads you into truth and is conforming you into the image of Christ. You're a new creation. You've been given a new heart. You've been sealed by the spirit with a spirit of power, not of fear. As if that was not enough. You've been freed not just from the guilt of sin, the punishment of sin. No, you've been freed from the punishment and the bondage of sin. You who were once a slave to sin, Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So you're walking around as if you're still in bondage to sin. But Christ says, no, I freed you from the bondage to sin. Now you can actually live a life of holiness because you're a new creation, because you have a new heart, because you have new affections, new desires. You have a spirit living within you. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead also raised you from the dead. As if that was not enough in the gospel. You've been adopted into the royal family of the king of kings. You've been given all spiritual blessings in Christ, even seated with him today, this very second in the heavenly places. As if that was not enough. You've been given a community, a church to express your hardship with, to say, brother or sister, pray for me. Brother or sister, can you Offer me help in this area. Listen, as if that was not enough in the gospel, we've been given access to the throne room of grace. Once our prayers were not heard because we were evil, but now in Christ, He hears our prayers. The Spirit helps us in our prayers. The Son reaches down and gets our prayers and gives them to the Father as He makes intercession for us at the right hand. As if that is not enough. Once we hated the word of God, now the word is life and bread to the soul. Now we have an endless stream of grace and mercy. Every morning, new mercy. Every morning, new mercy. Listen, in the gospel, the problem is not that we lack something in the gospel. The problem is not that we lack something in Jesus Christ. I gave you a very short list of what we have in the gospel just now. The problem is that we are out here walking around like orphan children, weak and beggarly, not knowing who our true heavenly father is. The problem is not that we don't have a heavenly father who has a storehouse of goods. The problem is that we never look up to plead before him. The problem is that we are settling by giving our hearts over to sinful desires rather than communing with the living God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We struggle, right? We struggle with avoiding to eat our own vomit, the proverb says. Why? Because we're failing to see the feast that we have in Christ. 
We're returning to our own vomit just like a dog does because we're failing to see the beauty and sufficiency and glory that the feast of Christ has for us as we meditate on Him. So whatever you're struggling with, whatever battle you have in 2020, what is the solution? Whatever it is, you say any sin in your mind, the primary solution is not, I'm going to stop doing that thing. If you struggle with lying, the primary solution is, I'm going to stop lying. No. Why? Because you'll just end up lying tomorrow. I know this sounds backwards, but listen, the primary solution is to preach the gospel to yourself. Reminding yourself what you have in the gospel of Jesus Christ and by faith, laying a hold of that so that your affections and your desires are transformed so that you no longer want to lie, so that you no longer want to commit those sins. Because when you cut down the weeds of sin, you just cut them down and what happens in a week? They'll come back up. You cut down the weeds of sin, they're back up. What do we need to do? Uproot the sin? Amen. But if you don't fill that void with something else, what's going to happen? A new weed of sin will come back up. So the solution is you uproot the sin. And in the void that is there, you place the seed of Christ and his gospel there so that you no longer have the desire to commit that sin any longer. So what hope do we have in 2020 against our evil hearts? Against this vile list of sins that Christ just gave to us? What hope is there? is that we would truly see the gospel as the primary source for not just regeneration, not just salvation, but for sanctification as well and for growth. Some might be saying, okay, I hear what you're saying. It's the gospel that's going to help us overcome, the gospel that's going to help us to fight sin. But what does that look like? I get it. Preaching the gospel to myself for all of life. I get it. I get it. But how does that help my fight against sin so let's look at some of this list that are here and that christ laid out for us number one evil thoughts how do i apply the gospel to evil thoughts that i'm having well you say primarily christ delivered me from my evil thoughts christ died because for me because of my evil thoughts and now he's cleansed me from that and more so, Christ died to give me a new mind so that I no longer had to give myself over to the evil thoughts. Christ has secured the best blessings that I do not deserve, so why am I giving my mind over to evil thoughts? You remind yourself of what Christ has done for you in the gospel so that you don't desire to have evil thoughts any longer. What about sexual immorality or, immorality or adultery? Well, you remind yourself, the gospel has secured for me an intimate relationship with the Trinity, with true love. The gospel has given me an indwelling spirit. Dare I join that spirit to a harlot? Dare I join the triune God to another? The gospel has promised me that God will always be faithful to me. Dare I be unfaithful to my spouse? See, when you re remind yourself over and over of what the gospel has done for you, what Christ has done for you, your affections and your desires will begin to truly change. For instance, theft, coveting, and envy. If you have a desire to be stealing or coveting or envious of another, you're communicating, I don't have enough in the gospel. I don't have enough in Christ. I don't have true satisfaction in Christ. I need what my brother has. I want to steal from that industry. I envy what brother or sister has. I'm coveting other things when the gospel has proven to me Christ is sufficient to satisfy all my desires and all my needs. Listen, this gospel, men sell all their possessions to buy that field. That's this gospel. So as you're struggling with coveting and envious, ask yourself, has not the gospel given me all of Christ? Am I not satisfied fully in Christ? No desire to pray. The gospel has given, shown us the price that Christ paid for us to pray. His death is what tore the veil open to have, for us to have access to the throne room of, throne room of grace. 
No desire to pray? Ask yourself, the gospel granted me access to pray. No desire to attend church? Did not the gospel purchase all of us this morning? Can't we look around and say, man, so-and-so was purchased by the blood of Christ. So-and-so was redeemed by the life of Christ. And I spurn the church of Christ? Christ gave his life for the church, and I neglect that bride? You see what I'm saying? When we apply the gospel to everyday life, it'll give us a true understanding of the price that was paid for our souls and how we live in the power and step of the Spirit. Congregation, this morning, truly we need the gospel to be pounded into our heads day after day after day, and we must lay hold of that gospel, the glorious gospel, when Christ on that cross suffered under the wrath of God so that we would not just be forgiven. That's where the modern gospel always ends, the death of Christ for forgiveness. But what I'm saying is that there's a further point to the gospel, not just forgiveness of sins because of the death, but raised to new life even as he was raised to new life. And for us to be able to walk truly in step of the power of the Spirit, there's more in this gospel of Jesus Christ that we could truly grab a hold of. And I, I just hope truly that in 2020, we stopped acting like starving orphans. We stopped acting, we stopped acting like as if we don't have a true armory to choose from in the gospel as we fight and wage war against sin. That we would stop doing it in our own strength, but that we would realize who we have in Christ, what he's done for us in Christ, our identity in Christ, our security in Christ, and our true hope and inheritance that we have in Christ. That's what Ephesians means when it says we've been equipped for every good work. Why? Because Ephesians 1 and 2 talks about who we are in Christ. So that we are now equipped for every good work. Brothers and sisters, if we have any hope in 2020, it's only the hope of Jesus Christ in the gospel against all the affairs of our life. Sin will begin to truly become bitter, as that old Puritan says, as Christ becomes sweet. Christ in his gospel. May 2020 truly be a year where we see our devotion to Christ and our love for the gospel increase. And in a true correlation, we'll see the sin in our life begin to decrease. Those things always work hand in hand together. Let's pray. Lord, we are truly thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel, Lord, that has saved us out of the pit of hell that we were in. The gospel that has redeemed our evil hearts and given us new hearts, Lord. The gospel, Lord, that where once we were headed to hell, Lord, now Christ carries us to heaven. Lord, the gospel where we were once filled with void in our spirit, Lord, and now Christ sends his spirit to make his home in our hearts, Lord. We need to realize how day and night the gospel is for us. How we were once darkness, but now we walk as children of the light, Lord. That is our great hope for 2020. That is our great hope against the enemy, against the flesh, and against sin, Lord. Not our own strength. No, it's the strength of the, of the man, Jesus Christ, who secured gospel hope for us. In his name we pray. Amen.